hopefully for them, they, uh, I mean, know the daddy. Professor Ethan Harvey Lovich, Professor Shimon Yankelevich, distinguished guests and colleagues. It is my honor and pleasure to open this mini workshop on commercialization of academic research results, policies, and regulation. Well, first I would like to thank the speakers who agreed to participate in the workshop what are you trying and to share do? their knowledge with us. I want to be able to look at the screen. A special thanks to Professor Hagin Messerov, no, wait a, no, no, don't turn it off, please. And manage to get yeah, okay. such a distinguished yeah. panel of experts. The issue of commercialization has been weaved lately into the university's life more than ever. However, the term commercialization encompasses more than just the simple, just the simple rules and technicalities. The idea behind the workshop was to try and give the audience the ability to examine this issue more broadly and from several angles. The way we academic scientists are used to deal with other issues. Uh, I hope you will not only enjoy this workshop, but also benefit from it. And I would like to now to invite want to turn it off? the okay. president okay, and the rector mm -hmm. to address some introductory remarks. Uh, Professor Karabinovich, please. Uh, the 
with the uh, other faculty members in, in the last few years, and that's very awkward. Very awkward for a uh, 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 management team of a university to press legal charges or to take to court one of, one of the faculty members. Yet we feel that uh, uh, we, are, uh, we are in charge of, of the intellectual property that's been deposited with us, and it's our duty to, to protect it. And we hope that by drawing clearer guidelines in years to come, this openness may be saved, uh, and that uh, the current legal action is the last instance of legal action that we will have had to, uh, to resolve with regard to faculty members. Another issue that I want to, to address, at least briefly, is I had, a, had a, a letter or a petition from a fairly large number of faculty members in the Faculty of Engineering um, protesting, let us say, the idea or expressing objection to the idea of creating um, or amalgamating uh, some of the operations of promote with the research authority, fearing that this could affect uh, their mode of, uh, of work. Let me make very clear promote is part of the Arabian For tax purposes, it had to be constructed as a Cooperation, but to all intents and purposes, it's an arm of the university. And um, the idea is to have uh, greater efficiency and effectiveness in the way the university uh, operates in this regard without negatively or adversely affecting uh, the researchers. And I'm sure to be in other discussions with, uh, uh, with Ruti, Shimon, Khalid, and, uh, and myself. So having said all of that, I, I hope that uh, this seminar this afternoon will be yet another step towards not narrowing but even totally eliminating the differences of view between management and, and faculty and hopefully we'll bring all of this to a successful and a cordial conclusion in the beginning of the coming academic year. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. In behalf of Tel Aviv University, I would like to welcome all the participants of this Tel Aviv uh, University workshop on opportunities and risk in commercialization of academic research uh, result, which really addresses one of the more important and uh, timely issues confronting any research university, and in particular Tel Aviv uh, University. Uh, it was mentioned here by the president, our IP, new IP regula uh, regulations, but I think that what we should do in this uh, workshop conf uh, conference is really to, although this is in the background, really to discuss the whole issue of uh, commercialization of academic research results uh, somewhat independently even of what's going on in, uh, tel uh, even on in uh, Tel Aviv. In any case, I'm sure that we are going to have a most challenging stimulation, a stimulating workshop with many discussion in, and debate. And I would like to make just few really general comments which are not really tied to the IP regulation of Tel Aviv University. I think that we will all agree that advanced nations depend increasingly on three critical elements. New discoveries, highly trained personnel, and expert knowledge, and that research universities are the primarily responsible and major source for supplying them. Now, traditionally, faculty in research universities transferred their knowledge to society at large only via their scientific uh, publication and uh, graduates. Direct com uh, commercial implementation of the new knowledge was in the past really rare. And this situation has We are living in an era in which science and technology have, uh, to a large extent, merged together. The time span between a basic scientific result and its possible application in many branches of uh, natural sciences is becoming shorter and shorter. The immediate commercial applicability of research results is increasing. Two, there is 
greater emphasis on advancing the country's economic competitiveness through commercial application of university research supported and funded by national resources. Three, we witness an increase in industry-university cooperation, which drives commercial application. In many countries, certainly in Israel, industries R&D is mainly D, development. There is an R, research component. It is mostly R, which is very much tied to D, certainly in this country. The research horizon of industry is usually two to three years ahead, looking essentially at the next product. And therefore, industry depends on your university's research, expertise, and cooperation for a further uh, horizon, let's say, of the order of five to ten years. Number four, university, and this was mentioned here by the president, universities struggling with financial difficulties, considering te technology transfer commercialization as a promising source of income. Five, faculty are more aware of the personal opportunities offered by commercialization of their research finding. And finally, society views technology transfer and the consequent creation of industry, and therefore down the road jobs, as a return on the public investment in the university system. Now, there are, of course, both benefits and risks to technology transfer, to commercialization. The benefits include the generation of a steady source of income to the university, which can be, as was told here, reinvested in pursuing the non-profitable academic goals of the university. It will free the university from total reliance on government public allocations that make the university vulnerable to non-academic pressures and endanger academic freedom, and we have witnessed such things here in this country. The opportunity to promote technology in practice, the ability of faculty to acquire practical experience, which helps teaching and research and offers a role model to students, and a change in faculty image in society as being remote from reality and living in an ivory tower. It promotes cooperation with industry and establishes the research university as the main source of long-term R for the industry. On the disadvantage, I can say that the disadvantages entail the risks of conflict of interest with academic research activities using the academic research resources for industrial use, the exploitation or possible exploitation of graduate students for the advancement of business interest, the temptation to, con uh, to concentrate on non-academic commercial activities and short-sighted business interest on the expense of basic science scholar activities, and creation of tension and a new type of inequality between members of the faculty unrelated to the traditional acad academic uh, excellence. This and other ethical and pragmatic questions such as the rights of staff and students to the benefits of their research results, the manner in which the benefits are divided between university and faculty and students, and the role of such activities on academic promotion will have to be addressed, will have to be addressed, since technology transfer has become and will become even more in the future a permanent and increasing dominant feature of the research university, and we cannot ignore it. So I'm sure that this and other questions will be raised in this uh, workshop, and there will be interesting discussion all, on all of them, and I'm really looking forward to a most challenging and stimulating workshop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Nakanevich. And the, uh, the three, four parts, for those of you who have the uh, program in their head, this will be a briefing. So now we move to uh, the first part, which is this the sign for that, about 45 minutes. And uh, this is the main lecture.
then we have about an hour of the panel discussion and another hour for a discussion with the audience. So the first part, the, uh, I'm honored to invite the uh, Professor Paul David, uh, after we <coughs> manage to pay here. Yeah, I am here. You know, just, just covered by this photo. A, um, <coughs> Now, along with the program, he did send you uh, parts of his CV, but for those of you who didn't do their homework, I'll just give a couple of highlights, saying that the, uh, Professor Paul David is a professor of economics and senior fellow of the Institute of Economic Policy Research at Stanford University, where he has been a member of the faculty since 1961. Since November 2002, Senior Fellow of the Oxford Internet Institute. A, uh, Dave is known internationally for his contribution in American economic history, uh, economic history and historical demography, and the economics of science and technology. He has published over 150 journal articles and contribution to uh, edited books. He is a founding editor of the International Journal of Economics of Innovation and New Technology, currently serves on the editorial boards of numerous journals as an elected member uh, in a number of, uh, and is a member in a number of distinguished national and international societies. Uh, Professor David has served as a consultant in the World Bank, the United Nations, Universities, Economic Commission of the European Community, as well as a number of US government agencies and foundations, including the National Academy of Sciences and the National Science Foundation and Departments of Commerce and of Energy. And I'm sure we are all going to enjoy this talk. Thank you. Please invite me. Thank you very much. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure. It's a Pleasure to, to be here. I think I think I will yell instead. Uh, uh, if you can't hear me, I, I think they need you for the recording. Okay, it's okay. Fine. Good. Um, let me see if I can uh, if I can find the uh, start start the uh, the movie uh, and. <laughs> I think it's only me. The audience um, won't, don't have to be taped. <laughs> I was going to say, yes, you can. I think you should ask to have it to uh, turn, to have it turned off. Okay. We, we recorded as a request of some of your colleagues who were unable to attend and asked if there is any other way that they can enjoy the fact that you brought such a, a famous and, and distinguished. Uh, Okay, so uh, should universities seek to commercialize their faculty's research? We've had uh, an excellent uh, introduction, if I may say so, from uh, President Rabinovich, from, from Dean Yankelovich. Uh, to this to uh, this question, and the uh, uh, it seems uh, from listening to the recitation of the underlying trends and forces uh, that um, whether or not uh, the answer is yes or no, it's going to happen. That seems to be the message. Uh, I want to try to uh, see if I can persuade you. Uh, that to uh, uh, to look skeptically uh, at having the universities enter as corporate players uh, into this business, uh, I am. I want to say I am not against the participation of university researchers in applied research. Uh, I am not against the transfer of university research findings. Uh, for commercialization in innovation uh, in the private sector. I think that there are alternatives, institutional alternatives, to having the universities 
take up a pursuit as commercializers and owners of intellectual property and, and managers of intellectual property in, on a very, very simple basis as an economist, I think, I believe in specialization and division of labor. I believe that institutions um, have de developed uh, functional capabilities uh, at which, if one wants to say uh, they're not perfect, uh, they are better uh, than other available institutions. And I think that the social functions of the university, the societal functions, which have uh, generated over a long period of time uh, public support for universities, conflict in fundamental ways with the pursuit uh, of the exploitation of knowledge uh, using the solution of, ownership, of assigning ownership and monopoly rights uh, in property and asking it, uh, the, in, the entity uh, to pursue those. I think that what you get from this uh, is uh, bad patents, bad exploitation practices, uh, and uh, at the same time, what you get is a confusion uh, in the goals uh, and the conduct of people within universities, as well as producing uh, even more dif differentiation uh, in the nature and, uh, and purposes, which undermine what I think uh, is the important academic ethos, which distinguishes universities from other entities in society, and which ultimately is the long-term protection uh, for the inter university uh, as an independent source of knowledge and a reference point for society, both as the preserver of cultural and scientific uh, heritage and the disseminator, and the connection point between uh, societies, uh, which facilitates the movement of knowledge and the movement of people. Okay. So that's, that's what I want to try to persuade you uh, of. Uh, I will uh, try and do this in two stages, and uh, then try to indicate what I think uh, are available alternative uh, solutions which address the very real problems uh, which we've heard from the president and the dean are facing uh, universities. I will try also uh, to, uh, to give you uh, some sense uh, of why we are here from a historical viewpoint as to how the model of university technology management and technology transfer has come uh, to be established and to be spreading, uh, as we have heard, uh, and being taken up by many universities and pushed uh, by uh, national uh, authorities and also uh, international and regional uh, agencies like the European Commission. Uh, okay, so now we have to see whether I can... Good, okay. So um, this, uh, this is the preview of coming attractions, if you like. Uh, 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 we, we have... We, uh, I first want to talk about a little bit more about what, uh, uh, why we are here and about the policy push uh, for universities to move in this uh, direction. And I'll say, uh, take as an, uh, as an example of that, uh, the kind of analysis which has recently emerged from the European Commission, which is advocating uh, that every European university should be in the technology licensing business. Uh, and the extent to which uh, they refer as, the, as their um, as the main exemplar of the success of this to the success uh, of the United States under the Baidol regime. Okay. Uh, so then I will want to go on uh, to say something about the reality of the Baidol regime how it started, uh, why it started, which is not for the reasons that people are want to take it up today, uh, in, to some extent, why it works the way it did. It's, it is not something planned. It's an emergent property of a very complicated system, 
uh, the U.S. innovation system, if you could call this system. It's a system which is very large, very diverse, and operating near the boundary of chaos. Uh, and things happen in it, which are then externally interpreted. Uh, and people say, well, in France, they would say, you know, une nouvelle défi américain, another American challenge that we have to respond to. And much of the rest of the world feels this way. So then I would like to look at the university uh, experience specifically in IPR ownership, commercialization, and faculty uh, experience. Implicitly, a lot of what is going on is imitation of uh, an experiment started in the US. Uh, and so, but people don't spend time looking at the actuality of what that experience has been. So I, I want to do that. And I would like then to continue to look at, uh, after looking at the faculty experience, looking at the administrative challenges. Uh, and and the, uh, as uh, the dean uh, suggested, or he's the rector, excuse me, uh, <laughs> as the rector uh, suggested, there, there are issues to be confronted. Okay? Well, it's indeed, these are issues which have been confronted. Uh, and there are people in the United States uh, who have a lot of experience who are beginning to say, was this trip necessary? Uh, were the benefits actually worth what appeared to be, what appeared to be they would be wonderful and they would save university administrators uh, from lots of problems? It turns out that there are lots of headaches. Uh, and actually, as you'll see, it doesn't save all except all that a handful. Then there is a question of an overall assessment. And I, I think that there are some uncertain short-term gains for universities and predictable long-term costs. I will say something very different because my research on this has been focused on countries other than Israel. And I'm prepared to say that Israel is a special case. What could be a special case? Uh, I hope to hear fully from others, but I also think that some of the Make, uh, which could make Israel's experience in this different from, from the experience of the United States, uh, you know, Motor Gross, uh, 3,000 institutions of higher education, uh, a, ver a very large and complex system, whereas you have here seven uh, research universities. Israel's experience could be very different. But in a number of respects, as a small country, uh, I think that the problems uh, of going this route uh, also uh, may make uh, for a special case which would argue against, uh, against uh, this and argue in favor of some alternatives. So um, let's see how we go here. Okay. So if we kind of think about uh, the the change that's taken place, uh, we can capture this as the emergence of a new mission for universities. Uh, universities underwent, have, have seen two major institutional innovations. Uh, the first uh, was the emergence of uh, the, uh, the, the Studium Generale, uh, to use the Latin, uh, a new kind of institution which emerges in Europe uh, in, uh, the, in the 10th century and really emerges uh, in Bologna and Paris and then Oxford and Cambridge, in which you have an aggregation of masters and students. The university was a donna term that was, uh, that, that was uh, referred to the institution. It referred to the corporate uh, organization of the students. Uh, first in Bologna, because the students needed mutual protection. Uh, they were organized in nations uh, because they came from all over Europe, and they needed protection against local authorities as well as innkeepers. Uh, and what you eventually had was the formation of a guild uh, using the Roman concept of uh, the universitas. Uh, was the union of students. In Paris, it was different. There was the union of masters because they were in a struggle against the cathedral schools uh, as to who could license people to teach. Uh, so you get this. It's only much later that you get uh, the, the application, uh, once, you get char once you get chartering, uh, to this particular institution, uh, which is an open uh, 
institution uh, with a lot of circulation uh, of masters and teachers in, in, in Europe. And then, the, then centuries passed uh, before you get the second revolution from the, the realization of Humboldt's dream uh, and the beginnings in the 19th century actually of the integration. So the question is now, are we, are, is it time for a third revolution in which we will add a third stream in which the university uh, having uh, begun in some places to integrate teaching with research, and some would argue that this fully, full development of the integration of teaching and research really came in the early post-war period because of the peculiarities of the American system, uh, the, the influence of the, of the Bush report uh, at the end of the, of the Second World War, and the major funding uh, of, un, of funda fundamental exploratory research through universities, as Bush recommended, became a pattern which is now uh, beginning to spread more widely, especially among those places where research and teaching, uh, where certainly undergraduate uh, teaching was separated, and in many cases even graduate uh, teaching was separated from research because uh, research is carried on in institutes. So we're, we're in a, uh, uh, we, we've worked through uh, the, this latest transformation, and now we've come to the point where people are urging uh, that, uh, uh, that, we, uh, that we, we go onward. So an emblematic uh, instance of this is a, uh, quote, communication, not an official uh, document. It's an intimation uh, from the European Commission of the direction in which they want people to go. And this uh, was about the role of universities in what they called the, uh, the Europe of knowledge. Uh, Basically, they said, well, the university is the most suitable institution for meeting Europe's critical needs in, uh, in uh, the epoch of knowledge-driven economic growth. I cite this not because it's necessarily relevant here, but because this is in the air. This is what everybody is here, and this is what uh, people who are concerned with the future of universities are hearing from either other uh, vice chancellors uh, and from, uh, from people in the ministries who are, uh, who are handing out uh, public funding. They view the, these uh, collection of institutions, uh, uh, the, not only the universities, but also the grand, the grand Ecole, the Polytechnics, the Fashion, as having a potential to be, um, in fact, more effective than European industry at the business of technologically driven innovation in the 21st century. There's uh, in, implicit criticism of, of the weaknesses of European industry, and the reasons for that I don't want to go into. Um, but they turned to universities, as many societies now uh, turn to universities either to blame them for things that are going wrong or to solve the problems uh, of, of society. The universities, to a certain extent, have brought this upon themselves. This is, in one sense, the curse of success of having been very good at doing some things, uh, they said, that's because we're so smart uh, and, uh, and because we can figure out. And because of the experience in the West, certainly in the United States and in Britain, during the war uh, period, the Second World War, people mobilized the resources of academic researchers to work on national emergency problems. Uh, in the background, uh, there is this sense that the, that this is, a national, this is a national resource which can be mobilized to deal with pressing national problems. Now, we are not in an active war, uh, but we have taken up the idea that we're in an international globalization struggle. Uh, and, uh, and, and this fashionable concept of uh, com international competitiveness uh, uh, is a driver of a lot of policy thinking. And the view is that you need to mobilize the resources of the entire society to be able to compete with, with, with your competitors. Okay? Now, in, now it's China. Okay? You can think back in, in, in which if we did not mobilize ourselves fully and reform institutions of the university in the, in the 1980s to deal with the threat of Japan, the economic threat of Japan, Western, you know, the, the Western countries would go down the tubes immediately, okay? So there, there is this sense of, of crisis, uh, and, and in a crisis, turn to universities. Now, I think it's very important uh, that, 
the, the wartime experience did not, in general, lead military people who are running defense research activities to turn to universities. Okay? They took people out of universities and they put them in Los Alamos and they put them in Lincoln Labs in the United States and they, and they put boffins in various places uh, at Harwell and other uh, establishments and they were there for a, what was a relatively limited duration. And they, and they did a lot of things which people today, particularly in engineers who I know who, who, say, who attack the position I have, say, look, all of the good things came out of, out of the wartime, the, the Brits say, the wartime boffins. It wasn't the universities. Okay, so, uh, so I said, yes, that's actually an important point. It was not the universities. Uh, the universities became either home to closed laboratories, as Lincoln Labs, and because that was convenient, because the people they wanted to use were there. But the universities actually were in a separate status, and there was enormous tension because they were ma they were managed by military people, and we know about the conflicts between Oppenheimer and the generals uh, in the Los Alamos project. Uh, and the most important thing was that it didn't go on forever. But global comp competition. Nobody is saying, "Oh, it's only three years. If we just put the resources into it, we'll win, and we can declare victory, and we can go back." to the way things were before. No, this is now for keeps. So this is what's being considered is a, is a, a more permanent restructuring. And therein, I think, lies, uh, lies the danger. So what does the commission do? It says, well, look, uh, we have to reform the university uh, so that it can carry on the mission which we want to give it. Okay, because there's some small problems with the university regulations which actually inhibit the ability uh, to, uh, for the university to form in this fashion as the driver of technologically driven innovation, not only in generating the knowledge, which is the basis for that, but in actually exploiting it and working with, uh, working with industry. Uh, well, they also sort of said that then there would be these benefits, now, about which we've heard. You could simultaneously meet the rising costs of public tertiary education and research, especially the rising research costs, because you would generate a stream of revenue which could be reinvested. Uh, and in the process, they said this whole thing would contribute to reaching what, at the time they wrote, were the Lisbon targets, uh, 3%, an arbitrary figure, 3% of G and, uh, the GDP was supposed to be invested in R&D. Where they got this figure, from? Well, they looked at Japan, they looked at the U.S., okay? Well, in Japan's case, the figure is close to 3%. In Sweden, it's something like that. In the U.S. case, if you take out the defense research, it looks more like 1.9% of uh, the civilian part. And there is a big problem for Europe, uh, that uh, maybe less of a problem than for Israel, that uh, the relative size of the defense-related research and the more long-term exploratory research, which uh, military establishments as patrons of, of science are really very, very good at hands-off, let people explore uh, what the future possible weapon systems might be or what we have to defend against. Uh, Europe doesn't have that. So in part, some of this is a, is a response. So th this is the, this is the, the policy, the policy, uh, the policy push. Okay. Well, one of the things which has given this a lot of uh, a lot of momentum, of course, is the fact that the university, in fact, all educational systems, are among the most mimetic institutions in the world. They copy each other, uh, at least in their outward form. If you if sociologists have studied this and have tried to take this as an index of modernization, and in fact have, have concluded in the end that it's not a very good index of modernization as to whether you have an educational, uh, secondary educational system with a board, uh, with a board of education, a ministry of education, uh, if you have a sort of a state university system, because everybody has them. There is, there's barely a country in the world that doesn't have something that's labeled that way. Of course, when you look at the reality of what, uh, the way this is actually implemented, there's a big range. 
And the same thing is true when you look within a country which is large enough uh, to have a substantial diversity, such as the United States. We have 3,000 uh, institutions of higher education. Uh, if you, we have 200 uh, so-called Carnegie uh, research institutions. Those are the institutions that absorb 98% uh, of federal funding. Uh, we have 100 uh, of those institutions which absorb about 74% uh, of, uh, of that funding. Uh, and we have 20 institutions that you can name, uh, okay? Uh, maybe more, slightly more. But, uh, so there's enormous creation, and the way in which everything about universities does get, that gets implemented gets implemented is different in different parts of the system, including relations uh, between universities and industry. So it's very important to, you know, to keep in mind what, what the target, what the model, what the set of universities who are the peers uh, that, you, uh, that you want to emulate uh, are, rather than take the kind of the average uh, uh, of practice. Um, so this concept of the triple helix, which is university, industry, uh, uh, business relations, uh, emerges in the U.S. particularly in the in the 1980s when uh, it actually starts in the late 70s with uh, NSF uh, proposals for uh, special kinds of university, industry, business uh, research centers, large engineering centers. Uh, it was actually Eric Bloch. Uh, who came from IBM into uh, into NSF, who started it. There was a lot of objection uh, in some of the non-engineering sciences uh, that this was taking money from uh, from fundamental research and so forth. Uh, but there was a push, and and during the during this period, um, although ostensibly uh, the U.S. said it had no science policy under the Reagan administration. You'll see there were many of these university industry uh, research centers uh, were created and, fu and, uh, and drew uh, funding in the state governments. The state government said, okay, we will fund these with matching resources, and they were oriented towards regional, uh, towards regional development. And from this has emerged a sort of a model which is now being imitated all over the world, okay? There are some things which have a helical structure. Uh, vi viruses have a helical structure, and I think this is an institutional virus. Um, uh, not, uh, not always benign. Okay. In addition, what you have is the beginnings of a new professional class you know, that emerged. University technology managers. This was started in the United States by, by Niels Reavers, who was, the first, who was the director of the Office of Technology Licensing at Stanford. He subsequently went to MIT. He went to Berkeley. Uh, he was the Johnny Appleseed of the industry. He went around uh, planting these. And now there are more than 2,000 uh, members. Uh, they have a lobbying office in Washington where they fight tooth and nail against anything which would disrupt or alter uh, this system. So you have an entrenched interest uh, there. Uh, and, and they speak about essentially the glories and essentialities of this. So when you make a change like this, you create uh, a vested interest uh, and uh, you are dealing with all, uh, all the things that people recognize instantly uh, when it occurs in the public sector that there are bureaucrats and there are people who want to continue the mission. Uh, in this case, uh, there, there are institutional interests uh, in, keeping, in keeping this going. This accounts in some part for the fact uh, that, as you'll see, for most of the institutions in the United States, well, a very large proportion of the institutions actually have no licensing revenue at all, even though they're all patenting. They are all technically in the stock business. They're underwater, okay? Uh, they have, they're sort of in the red on operating expenses, never mind the fixed facilities that they are. And, you, and, the, and they can't be turned off because the emblematic aspect of having an office of technology license is that you're actively contributing to some regional development, to, some, to the national competitiveness, uh, and, and, and if you try to switch them off, then they call the state legislatures, and the state legislature says, well, ah, your university is no longer supporting the industry of Nebraska. Uh, you, uh, uh, the taxpayers are not going to get anything back from the university. So 
you have this kind of uh, in, entrenching uh, effects. And then we also have the international interpretation of the U.S. Bayh-Dole experience, which is what I want to, which is largely based uh, not on a close uh, familiarity with what actually uh, turned out uh, to be the case. Okay. So, all right. Well, I've already told you uh, uh, what the argument is, but I want to, I want to break it into two parts. I want to critique the sort of assessment of the, let's take the EC assessment and the proposals, okay, and argue that they really proceed from an adequate assessment of the system uh, uh, which the universities perform one part, okay? So I want to take a systems perspective on this, and I want, uh, and, I'll and I'll try to proceed from a view that, to summarize it briefly, says virtually every country has found two different kinds of solutions to the to the economic problem that's posed by the peculiarity of information as a commodity. Information is, n and by extension, I like to talk about knowledge as a human capability, and information as a co as codified, a codification of, of knowledge, uh, which allows it to be more readily transferred, uh, okay, as well as manipulated, if you get it. The, into, into digital form. Uh, okay, so we have the fundamental problem is that you have here a commodity which has the properties uh, which resemble that of what economists call pure public goods. A pure public good is not, uh, it's, it's more like fire than it is like coal. Okay? If, you, if I give you a lump of coal, and then I give you another lump of coal that looks just like it. You have two lumps of coal. If I tell you my idea, okay, and then I tell it to you again, you don't have two ideas. You just have the one idea. In addition, if I tell you my idea, you can use it and I can use it. We don't have congestion effects. We, we don't uh, consume the idea. It can be infinitely reused. Moreover, if I have an idea, uh, I have to, and I don't want you to use it, I have to go to some cost to prevent you from having access to the, to the use of it, okay? I, I like to, to quote, this is not new. It's true that Kenneth Arrow elaborated a lot of these ideas following the implications of the, of the idea of public goods applied to information. The idea of public goods is elaborated by Paul Samuelson in, uh, in the early, in the 50s. But uh, this is an old idea. Thomas Jefferson, uh, in a letter to Isaac McPherson, a Baltimore inventor in 1813, who was complaining that he had a natural right to a patent, said, no, there are no natural rights to ideas, uh, because, uh, because a, a provident, uh, pro provident nature has made ideas uh, like fire, expans infinite, expansible over space without lessening their density at any point. He said, he who lights his candle at mine gains illumination without darkening me. Okay? He said, that's what ideas want. He said, society can arrange things if they want uh, to give people a property right in the, ex in, the, in the use of this. But that's not a natural right. It can't be a natural right. It's a socially constructed right. And there has to be a good reason. And, and the reason is that by getting people to disclose what they know, they actually get to utilize the feature of an idea, which is you know, that all people uh, can use it, and they give people something in exchange. Okay. Well, that's one way of doing it. That's the market fact test, that you create a property uh, which doesn't exist naturally. The alternative is uh, that you essentially find either a way to use general revenue to give people funding to do research and share their ideas, okay? So that's the concept, uh, if you like, what close to the concept that uh, we, I, I, would, I would call uh, in, in its application in science, open science, supported by grants. Uh, it's non-directed. Another variant it's, which many places have used, particularly in what are regarded as vital uh, uh, industries like national defense, is government production. 
But in the United States, we had government research in, lab, in agricultural lab, uh, experiment stations. And so there's direct production, where there are government institutes and laboratories. So government institutions and, labor and laboratories are one form of the public provision. Uh, grants uh, are another. And we can have some other mixtures. But the main distinction is between market, the, between the market solution, where there's property created, and an alternative. Now, commercial. The commercial sphere of R&D is running on the property solution. And it has a lot of benefits because it, it's by connection to the market, it drives research from the demand side. It addresses uh, the needs of ultimately of consumers, uh, the users, and you, uh, you get people's attention uh, geared uh, to how you can use existing knowledge to produce new goods, uh, better, uh, more efficient uh, processes. The drawback uh, of this uh, is that if you run the whole system like that, it's not necessarily a system which is very good for advancing uh, fundamental knowledge, because fundamental knowledge usually will open up new possibilities that nobody has thought of, that consumers haven't thought of. You want to get ahead of them in some way, create some new space in, in which could then be adapted. And this system, uh, which also gives control over the uses of knowledge, typically to the person who gets the patent on it, doesn't necessarily uh, put access to the new knowledge in the hands of people who are most imaginative about the ways in which it could be exploited. So if you think about the, uh, the early people who developed um, the laser, or, or you know, Einstein's paper, uh, which identified the possible the photoelectric effect, uh, uh, which, which underlies uh, the, the laser phenomena. Uh, those people uh, were not the people who had the idea uh, first, uh, well, you know, what, did la what did people in laboratories do with the laser? They thought, this is a fantastic thing. You can use it to replace one of the research assistants. Why? Well, because it took two research assistants, each on a piece of string, to align laboratory equipment. But if you could use a laser, you could align the equipment, and you could get rid of one of those, and the string. Okay? Well, it took a while before people began thinking about laser surgery, about using lasers uh, to uh, uh, actually to read uh, uh, what's on a CD. Uh, there's a whole range of things. So uh, the idea that you have a cumulative development process, okay? uh, but that you do this through a property system, then creates the problem of how broad is the property grant. Do you want to let people have the, give them the incentive to develop something new by giving them the right to all of the exploitation? Well, pass-through licenses uh, and other arrangements which are now uh, emerge in, in, in fields working close to the to the frontier of new knowledge, uh, have this feature of giving the original uh, person you know, a claim uh, on, on all of the future possible inventions which will in some way be, be, be based on it. And that, uh, in some respects, inhibits people uh, who, it creates entry barriers for people who come from the outside with an entirely new uh, ap uh, application. The open science system is very good for generating new knowledge. Okay, for various reasons, which I could take a long time explaining, uh, but basically uh, by, by transferring knowledge to other people, it creates a, a large number of people who in general are positioned uh, to rapidly evaluate new additions. And so it increases the rate of advance of the stock of reliable knowledge. Okay. It, it allows you to mobilize problem-solving uh, capabilities, which are beyond the reach of the, of the particular research uh, units that get the idea. But it has a fatal flaw. You, in this system, you essentially have to give away what you learn. Okay? You, have to, you are meant, the norms require that you not only publish the result, but you publish the way you got the result. You have to show the methodology so it can be replicated by others. And speed of replication is is, a, is socially desirable. It creates a race uh, for uh, the kind of credit which one gets uh, from having priority of discovery, uh, pr the cl priority claim of a validated 
uh, research finding uh, creates a certain amount of racing and that. Okay, 10 minutes more to go. Thank you. And I have water too. Okay, this will make it go faster. Okay. okay, so these two systems, I just want to suggest, uh, are confidential. Neither is a, is a, is, gives you a, com a complete well-functioning system. And, mo and the major problem for research, for research policy, science and technology policy, is to get the balance between uh, these two systems in terms of the deployment of resources, correct? And to provide mechanisms uh, which allow them to, to work together in a useful way to coordinate, to, coll to collaborate at some basis. And what I want to argue is that this is a problem of finding the right institutional mix and the, and the right balance of funding among institutions, not the problem of trying to create a shimmer, of creating, taking two types of institutions, each which have a specialized function, and then trying to put them together uh, under, one, uh, under one roof. Okay, so let me now pick up some speed and, uh, and, and ask and try to answer three questions, okay? So one question which is of less concern here was, is there really a problem arising from a failure to, to, transfer, uh, to transfer research? Okay. The second is, does the U.S. experience uh, suggest uh, that uh, you can expect to, to stimulate university researchers to patent new in, uh, innovations in, in general? Uh, or are we looking at a phenomena which is largely, not exclusively, but largely uh, in uh, biotechnology and in a few other fields in which patents uh, are important? Because the step from having the idea, like a new molecular structure gives you a step to a new ch chemical entity, gives you a step to a new drop. You know? Or uh, a mathematical algorithm uh, or class of proofs uh, in number theory, as I've heard, gives you a step to uh, public key encryption or some other kind of uh, encryption technology and uh, something you can, uh, you can implement uh, either in silico or, or in software, uh, and, it's a new, uh, and it's a new product. There are a few areas like that, but the question is, what is the so-called success of the U.S. Uh, and the increase in the amount of patenting, which refers to scientific papers, really based on? Okay, is it a general new trend, or is it something which is really uh, a matter of what's gone on in biotechnology in the last 20 years? And the third um, is the question of: Do we have evidence suggesting that uh, becoming better at knowledge management? Uh, and accumulating rights, universities are going to be able to solve uh, financial problems. Okay. I just want to put up just some numbers. Uh, in the first, comparing the first two columns, there's been a good bit of recent research, even more recent than uh, that which I'm citing, which says that there was a long and history of university faculty involvement in applied research. Okay. In the German universities, the professors own the patents. It's only recent, the legislation has only recently been changed. There's a long history of close consulting, particularly in the, in the chemicals industry and in industries re, uh, related to that, and in some branches of applied physics. Uh, so, uh, so there's a distinction to be, an important distinction to be made as to whether uh, it's university corporate participation as opposed to participation of university faculty. And in the European case where they say, well, a Europe's problem is that universities aren't patenting anything, that is different from saying university faculty uh, is, uh, is not translating their, uh, their research. Okay? So, okay. So this is uh, just the first uh, issue. The answer is that at least for the European case, for people who say, uh, and people who say, well, the problem is that the, uh, the Tel Aviv University isn't doing much technology transfer. That's true. That appears to be true at the corporate level. There is a question as to, how, as to whether people in the University of Tel Aviv are actively oriented towards, in a, towards commercially relevant innovation, whether they are engaged in technology transfer, whether they have close relations with, uh, with business firms. Some of the argument says that this relationship 
of the university is good because it uh, orients the faculty towards doing applied kind of research. Well, it may be, as is the case in Europe, that the faculty already in substantial number are oriented that way and that what we're actually maybe doing is to put into place a set of things which actually disrupt existing network of consulting agreements and other things. Whether you want to have those consulting agreements is a separate question, but we could, we'll do, uh, no doubt debate that. Okay. Uh, how justified is the new hope about patent seeking? Okay. Well, I'll just summarize this um, and go past a lot of the, uh, the documents. Say, in a great, to a great extent, this view is grounded on, the, uh, on perceptions of U.S. Uh, from, from afar. We've had rapid increasing in patenting. Uh, we've had university patent focus in the life sciences. And it turns out that academic science-based patent growth, as indicated by patent citations to scientific publications, to a great extent involve university people in biotechnology citing their own papers or the papers of their colleagues or uh, not only at the same university but, uh, but elsewhere. Okay. So just to tell you there are some numbers that go beyond this. Uh, what you had is a long period of rise of university industry research centers increasing patenting. Uh, you have patenting by research universities in the, in the 80s on the basis of some of these research centers and that you've got the, the promotion of biotechnology by a massive shift in federal funding uh, into this area. Uh -huh. uh, and so you, this is the pattern of university industry research centers uh, growing. What they started growing before uh, the Bayh-Dole Act of uh, 1980 uh, and, uh, and then they, uh, they grew rapidly uh, in, uh, in the 80s, not as a consequence of Bayh-Dole but as a, a, to a certain extent by the liberalization, but as a deliberate policy of, uh, of, of university, of state and federal university funding. Um, this is just a point that you've got these technology cit uh, citations to, uh, to Paris uh, to, uh, to uh, patent citations to technology uh, are contributing uh, to an additional portion amount to the aggregate trend in technology citations to, to science. And this looks at, uh, at the rise of, bi this is the differential effect in, bi uh, in biotechnology uh, compared against, uh, against chemistry. Okay. Um, okay, so I think I want to say this vision uh, that the future is of innovation driven by, uh, by university-based technologies uh, is not, uh, it amounts to betting the store uh, on uh, biotechnology or on the experience of biotechnology. Uh, all kind. The genesis of this thing. Very briefly, uh, I don't have time to do this in detail, but you can read that while I talk. Basically, the Bayh-Dole Act was passed as a rider to a small business appropriations bill uh, written at the time when the U.S. had stagflation, high unemployment rates, worried about job creation, uh, as well as inflation. There was a, a, a frenzy of activity based on the premise uh, documented that 85% of new jobs uh, occur in small firms, small and medium-sized firms. Um, but the, what the author of this paper left out was that 85% of job losses occur in small and medium-sized firms. This kind of high turnover, but the Small Business Administration was seeking expansion of the funding as the solution, a job creation solution, and this collided with, a, with something else that was happening at the time. Uh, HEW, Department of Health, Education, and, uh, and Welfare, which uh, was responsible uh, for drug, uh, for Medicaid, for the beginnings of the Medicaid program, became concerned about the policy uh, that they were following of allowing universities to patent and special ins institutional patenting agreements on the basis of fairly funded research. Uh, director of HEW said, we're going to review this policy because of its potential adverse effect through raising the prices of drugs. Uh, and a number of universities which had been doing this, including Stanford University, uh, said, my goodness, this will further uh, complicate our lives. 
and Niels Riemers at Stanford was one of the people there. And he and some other people actually wrote the riders into the legislation. Supported by Senator Dole, Birch Bayh in Indiana was in favor of job creation. Senator Dole was in favor of removing bureaucratic red tape wherever it existed. And the idea of sweeping away all the, all the regulations that the Department of Defense or the Department of Energy or HEW might impose on anyone who wanted to start a new business based on university patent, that appealed to him. And that's how this thing came into existence. It was limited to uh, exclusive patents only in the case of small firms. There were size limitations. No large firms were supposed to be involved in it. Under the Reagan administration, uh, the lobbyists got to the White House very quickly. And uh, by, uh, by 1980, uh, Three, there was an executive order which, which said this is uh, for large firms as well, and then the act was amended in the, following, in the following year. And it was in the course of the 80s that people found a new rationale for this, which was that this was going to save America uh, from Japanese competition. Okay, so this is just reviews, sort of so, some of this history. Okay, this is the the rise in university licensing income. The latest figures uh, show that it's about uh, close to, uh, to 1.4 billion, okay? With, uh, now, let's look at it, okay? This is the distribution of licensing revenues, okay? So if you wanna say, well, what is 1.4 billion? It's a very small portion of the operating cost of American universities, That's trivial, okay? below 2%. Uh, uh, and what people, what you hear about is the extreme tail of this distribution, where a very small number of universities have some very substantial hits. Uh -huh. This is not a characteristic of universities, this is a characteristic of patents, okay? This is patents uh, are, this payoff is very skewed, there's one or two. So basically, what you have is that 47% of the universities have no licensing revenue at all, and yet they're all patented, okay? And it costs about $25,000, uh, going up to $30,000 to file a patent uh, in the States, okay? So that's a lot of activity, um, which is a kind of a goodwill public service, transfer, uh, transfer, okay? And that's an underestimate. Two minutes, right? Start so summarize. So, so the question is, how many of these big hits? The notion that you get a steady stream of funding universities out of this is an illusion, okay? This is much too unpredictable. You cannot take this, you know, you cannot bet on this. Uh, this is extra, a little bit of extra funding. It will, it will, the lucky ones will help, but there are many more losers uh, in this. Uh, this is a lottery with many more losers uh, than winners. Okay, here are some of, here are some of the, uh, the winners, the three winners. And you could see uh, in here, if you look at, you know, look how well they're doing, look at how much of their revenue is generated just by the top five. Okay, so it's uh, Columbia, it's up in the 90s, 90%, Stanford, it's 85. Uh, and city, uh, we've lost the Cone Boyer patent, so, so, that, uh, so the share has probably dropped a, a little bit. Uh, but California, that's the entire University of California uh, system. Uh, and so they've got a lot, a lot of, uh, of mediums, medium size uh, earners. So that even, even within them, uh, you've got a very small number of hits. And that means that uh, it's hard, A, hard to plan for. Uh, and B, you have to actually you know, be fairly careful uh, about how you, uh, how you license them and how, you, how intelligent you are about uh, licensing. Okay, so I don't think that this is the solution to the problem. Uh, okay, so, uh, and then you have to consider all of the side effects. And we'll hear more about these, uh, the openness of university communities, the teaching and research environments, the conflicts of interest, uh, which, which are created when you try to manage a commercial uh, enterprise in a, in, a, in, a, in a proper fashion. Look at what industry does. Uh, they have trade secrecy, they have hairdresser clauses. Uh, they make people sign lab, sign lab books. They transfer lab books. Uh, they are, uh, and, and we find 
I find, in, to my amazement, uh, that in Britain, the universities have gone completely overboard, and every student, undergraduate and graduate student, uh, who is matriculated, has entered by matriculating into a master-servant relation with the university. They have a duty to protect the university's interest in intellectual property arising in the course of their instruction. They are told that you should not put answers to your homework assignments on the internet, because after all, you could be like George Danzig. Remember George Danzig, who, who the professor wrote an insoluble problem up on the corner of the blackboard? Uh, he came late to class, and he copied it down because that's where the homework assignments were. He came back after the weekend and handed in his paper at the professor who says, I had a lot of trouble with this. Uh, please tell me where in the book it deals with, with the optimization uh, with inequality constraints. And the professor said, no, that wasn't a homework assignment. That was an unsolved problem. He said, well, I think that, uh, that this uh, simplex method I have could be useful. Okay? And it was. Okay? So, uh, so there, there's one. Uh, okay? So, but ever after, people said, yeah, but if we'd only gotten the patent on the simplex method. Okay? All right. So, all right. I've talked to a lot of research students in Oxford who are computer programmers and doing stuff. And they say, I have three ideas. For, for companies, but I think I'm waiting till I get out of here, and be, till I get out of England, uh, before I talk about them. Okay, all right. Uh, so, so you think I have to think about what is the incentive effect? Okay, especially in a country like Israel, where people can go out uh, and think and not cut themselves off and come back and start companies in other places. So uh, the view that you can change the incentive structures uh, without, and not disturb anything is something an economist would tell you, uh, you know, don't, don't, bet, don't bet on it. Uh, and then we have all the complexities of managing. You know, should you license to the competitor of a firm that has been giving you equipment gifts? Okay. You license their competitor? Well, you hear about it from them. Okay? And that tends to disturb the university affiliates programs because the close connections that you have with placement of your students, uh, lots of things that are built up, become complicated with the question of who you're doing business with in the licensing office and what the terms are. And people who have been giving you gifts want better terms. Okay? But that interferes with actually maximizing the revenue flow uh, from this. And there are stories that could go with all of these things. And then finally, I think the most important, and I'll quit there, uh, except for the last slide, is that the perception of the university as a commercial ag agency with its own economic interests, which may not be allied with those of the public, which may not be allied with other groups, begins to erode the fundamental basis for the support uh, of, the, of the university. Uh, and opens it to all kinds of attacks. And I would remind you that in the recent debates in England about the boycott of Israeli universities, okay, launched there, the people who defended and were successful first in canceling the boycott did this on the basis that university research should be open, should be free. There should be no impediments to exchange, uh, to contacts, and so forth. And once you begin to say, well, well, it's okay for us to do it, but other people shouldn't do it, then you're on a very, very shaky uh, political ground. And that the, ultimately, the freedom of the universities has to be defended politically. Uh, and, and this may be a big uh, weapon uh, to give uh, to, the other, to the other side. So this is a catalog of all the other, if I can use the word, surus that you can have uh, from, uh, from this. Uh, so, four strategic guidelines. First, uh, policy people should not do harm. Uh, second, uh, you should not blend institutions. You should try to change the mix. You can keep patents in their proper place. Remove the ownership and management from university of university generated IP to remove the conflicts with teaching and publicly ref uh, funded research activities. Require uh, IP to be assigned to independent foundations pools which could be managed, uh, fenced off uh, for support of competitive peer-reviewed research. Uh, there are a lot of bridge institutions which could be created. There are some models, uh, both present and past models, of separate institutions uh, which, uh, which could perform the bridge transfer functions. 
which could which could function to manage research portfolios essentially and separate this from the universities and could then be essentially taxed by the public authorities that create them and fund uh, research uh, through the income which is generated. And they can, by pooling, they can more efficiently manage research portfolios and likely uh, extract larger income. So uh, yes, I think it's time for institutional innovation, but in innovation does not mean turning businesses into another institution which we have, uh, which is well worked out, which is corporate profit, see profit uh, seeking corporations uh, and in the process destroying the unique features of the university. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for pushing, but the, uh, we are we have the end of our uh, senate. Uh, thank you very very much for uh, this enlightening uh, uh, talk, and I would like now to invite Hagit to chair the uh, responding the the, the uh, text, the whatever. <laughs> Uh, no, no, we'll, we'll have discussion in the end, but I'd like to invite now the three panelists, please, Eran Bareket, uh, Tzvika Arstein, and Yoel Mokir, please. Yes, yes, please. Uh, we got some uh, insight from Paul about the international, mostly American and European perspective now we have uh, three panelists two of them are uh, uh, israelis who can talk about the israeli perspective of this uh, issue and uh, yoel also can speak uh, english e hebrew but uh, his perspective is more the historic one is it me uh, we'll give like 15 minutes to each of you and then uh, we'll have an open discussion with the audience and with having Paul again. First, Iran, please. Uh, you have uh, also the biographies or the very short biographies of uh, the three speakers. Uh, Iran is an advocate. He deals with the intellectual property rights and university research. And uh, we are honored to have him here. Please, Iran. when uh, managing intellectual property towards commercialization, and I will speak about them. But at the end of the day, I think that one thing is clear. Um, the results of the research are an asset, and it needs to be managed one way or another. Um, and the university can decide that it wants to donate this asset to the public. Uh, but that also needs to be managed. So the university can decide that it wants to uh, commercialize those uh, results, it requires uh, management. Uh, one could foresee a, a solution whereby the uh, management is uh, transferred to an outside organization, as Professor David has uh, uh, suggested. But at the end of the day, there must be management, because if there's no management, um, the uh, intellectual property will not, will not stay there. Someone will take it. All university research is unmanaged. I, I agree. It's done uh, on a personal basis as uh, an active research. I, I agree. The, the Let's work, the work, the discussion uh, for after. No, no, I, I, I will respond because I agree that the research should continue. But the question is what happens to the result? And the answer is that the results will leak to uh, private institutions who will uh, patent those results. And then you will face the problem of uh, impediment on further uh, research. So you need to manage the, this uh, exclusivity rights properly so as not to uh, prevent further uh, impediments on research. And Israel is, is uh, put it this way, I, I do, as, as was said before, it seems that uh, this road will be taken one way or another and the universities will commercialize uh, intellectual property, as they do already, some of the most success 
some um, with less. And Israel is not different than any other countries. I don't know if you know, because of Australia, but we have a pending bill in the parliament in the Knesset uh, that aims to um, regulate the uh, universities' commercialization of research. Um, it has several problematic uh, ideas, and I will, I, I will try to touch them. It's called the Zahat Chok the Yehuda Abarat Yedat Ekologi Al-Tibur. Israel also has certain unique problems. It's in our spending on, on uh, uh, defense is much higher than other Western uh, countries. We have other uh, uh, politically oriented spendings, and, and as was said before, uh, by Professor Rabinovich, we don't see uh, an increase on governmental spending on research in the universities. On the other hand, I think it would be a mistake to think that uh, the fruits of the commercialization would be a significant. Uh, budget of the university, the end of, and, and it has also um, other risks involved when, when you look at it that, um, that way. Uh, if you build on, on the uh, income that would be generated from commercialization of patents, then you switch from dependence on the government to dependent on, on, on the uh, private sector. So you just uh, switch the entity on which you are uh, dependent. And another comment? I think that the university at the end of the day does not commercialize. At the end of the day, it merely manages uh, intellectual property and those who will commercialize the, the uh, information and the fact, fact technology would be the licensees or assignees of the, uh, of the patents. Um, but it, it is the duty of, of the academic uh, institute to manage its uh, intellectual property rights portfolio in a way that will serve public good, the universities that, uh, include, and not only the particular universities, but also other universities. Um, and, and I've mentioned uh, several problems that one uh, um, can foresee when you, when you speak about uh, commercialized, commercializing uh, uh, academic research. First of all, Patenting means exclusivity, and exclusivity is the direct opposite of science, of open science. There is no science but open science. Um, if you, if, when, you, when you are too much dependent on, dependent on patenting, then you uh, face the risk that uh, investment of scientific resources will be based on the expected uh, um, commercial return on investment. If you take uh, monies that are generated from the commercialization of patents and allocate them to the faculty or the lab of the researcher that uh, has uh, contributed to the invention, then you are mixing uh, the decision of uh, how to fund basic research, which will be objectively uh, decided, with notions of commercialization and expected return on investment that is extagent, dangerous. Patenting and exclusivity may create barriers to access to information. Um, if a researcher calls me and asks me whether he or she can use a DNA from a DNA sample from a DNA bank because of certain uh, intellectual property rights, you can, you can appreciate that, that, it, that this, this commercialization creates impediments on, on uh, access to um, information. The, uh, Prevalent practice of trust of materials is different when you when you have to think all the all the day about uh, intellectual uh, property. Um, in addition, um, if the uh, income generating portfolio is not large enough, litigation threats may also pose a uh, problem. I will mention that later on. Uh, when the university or academic uh, institution is dragged into litigation, it's not pleasant. And there may be identification uh, provisions, that, uh, but the arrangement, but this is, a tech, this is a legal solution. Uh, there may also be practical problems uh, there. Uh, patents are given, especially in the biotech uh, fields, on uh, research tools and, and on such matter which is used in, in research, like uh, genes and uh, ESCs and SFPs. They are used both as research tool and, 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 and as a subject matter that is used in basic 
uh, research. But when, when one invents a new product, it gets a, he or she gets get an absolute protection. Without, if someone else will later on come up with a new way to produce the same product, uh, the second inventor will be prevented from, utilizing, from using his invention until the expired the patent. Uh, in the early days of recombinant DNA, people had uh, patents Can, uh, can create barriers to access to information. It's discontent. If you read the, the FTC's 2003 report uh, on uh, patents and competition, they bring a telling story about the barriers to entry to uh, the commercial arena, which small and innovative companies may face. And again, barriers to entry to the, acad the academic scenes with more, small, academic, which small academic institutions may face is a threat. Um, and again, one could say that the university can uh, safeguard itself and, and protect its interests through its licensing uh, arrangements. But I would expect that most universities would not try to protect the uh, research interests of other interests. We are all in one uh, community. Um, another word of caution, if IP management transpires to be uh, compassing, then the money which we all work on will go uh, away. For example, the pending bill in, in the Knesset um, aims to regulate, regulate at the uh, primary legislation level the rules for licensing of IP. This is doomed to fail. One cannot uh, prescribe the rules for licensing of IP at the primary legislation level. Um, if you also take, for example, the uh, example of the investment in uh, industrial uh, R&D by the Office of Chief Scientist, encouragement of uh, research and R&D, um, the initial idea was to keep the technology here. But then, um, uh, the industry created its pressure, they gave their warning, and at the end of the day, the Office of Chief Scientist succumbed, and the, the law was passed, and now it's okay to transfer the technology abroad. It may be good, it may be bad, I don't know, we'll see whether it will work or not, they have their arrangement, but it certainly shows that the initial uh, intention of the legislative bodies, whether in the Knesset or in the university, will not will certainly not, not always be the end uh, result. Now, uh, Professor uh, David mentioned the problem of changing public views. A case, a legal case, which uh, was litigated uh, in the last couple of years in, in the US was Medi versus, Medi versus Duke. Medi was a um, researcher, a researcher in uh, physics in one of the universities, and the details are not important, and they don't have sufficient time. He was a Duke? He was a Duke? He was, I think he was in Cornell. He was in Stanford, came to Stanford from Cornell, then went to Duke. Yes, but the problem was that he was in his first university, he got patents in, in his own name, then he got a lab at Duke, and then there were accusations about mismanagement of the lab, and he, he was forced to leave, and then he sued the university using his patent, arguing that the university and the continued work on the lab infringes on his patents. And one can make various arguments on patent law and patents on research tools. I will not get into that. It's not on the point. But what is on the point, and I will read to you um, two short paragraphs from the court's decision. Was the court says, Maddie argues that Duke is in the business of obtaining grants and developing possible commercial applications for the fruits of its academic research. Why, this, why was this argument made? because the university argued that it is shielded under what is called the experimental use exception. We are not in the business. We are conducting basic research. So we should not be sued on the basis of this, this patent. But the court did not entertain that argument. The court um, ruled by a majority that, uh, and I'm reading and quoting, for example, major research universities such as Duke 
often sanction and fund research projects with arguably no commercial application whatsoever. However, these projects unmistakably uh, further the institution's legitimate business objective, funding and educating and enlightening students and faculty participating in these projects. These projects also serve, for example, to increase the status of the institution and lure lucrative research grants, students and faculty. So if you enter into the business arena, you should be prepared to be viewed as business. You should be prepared to see uh, uh, the process of getting a research grant for basic research as part of the business, which can be prevented by use of patents. And that does not mean that the university should not manage patents. It means that the university should be aware of these concerns and manage patents properly so as not to create, so as to try to avoid those uh, risks. Again, management must be uh, conducted. Um, the, this, this change in, in the public perception, when coupled with other uh, notions of, of, of our system in Israel, for example, here in Israel, uh, unfortunately, uh, many of our judges, including in the Supreme Court, do not share the view of Thomas Jefferson in the United States. They do not view uh, intellectual property and uh, patents as something that is aimed to serve as a um, certain public good. They look, at, they look at patents as a natural property, as a natural right for a property. And then they, are, they even add and say this is, patents should be protected on the basis of, uh, on the, basis of uh, the uh, basic law of uh, human dignity as a right of property. So if you have very strong enforcement of property rights, and uh, very na narrow exceptions for research, the result uh, is uh, uh, clear. Um, I think that uh, uh, in, this in the slide that I saw, Professor Deville, he mentioned, problem of mentioned problems of students and colleagues. Again, speaking from my own experience, uh, Fights over patents uh, are already here. Who is the inventor? Is it the, uh, is it the professor or the student? Mm -hmm. Now, admittedly, um, uh, credit was al always important and people could argue about credit, but now we bring into the situation also money and dreams of becoming rich, and it gets complicated. Um, Again, I, I've seen excellent scientific teams that broke up on account of patent entitlement uh, disputes. Uh, so, at the end, I think it's a delicate, delicate task that the academic institution is faced with. But it, it's one that the academic institution must take, must do its best to manage. Um, and one thing is, is certain, at least in my opinion, that Certainty is of crucial importance. We need to know where we stand, what are the rights, and what are the duties. Again, speaking from the private sector, where I see um, um, researchers, uh, doctors in the uh, hospitals, who have ideas, who got some money, they, they try to raise some money, but then there's uncertainty about the ownership of the, of the intellectual property. And at the end of the day, if you don't have it today, it can become a larger problem later on. So to all of us, it's important to have certainty to begin with. And, and the introduction of the bylaws of the uh, university is, a, is a, an important step towards achieving certainty. Um, I, I will end with a short comment about the uh, situation. I will end with a uh, short comment about the um, general uh, scheme under, our, under the general patent so it always looks as if the uh, lawn's neighbor is greener and it's not, it's not always like that. First of all, um, as a general statement I think that one can say that the current legal situation under the Israeli patent law is unpleasant from the point of view of the research. Um, employers rights are extremely strong Title to invest to invention invention is vested with the um, employers, save for uh, exceptional circumstances as a matter of practice. And there are two prongs for the uh, um, entitlement for the ownership rule of, of the employee, and they have been interpreted very broadly. 
Um, for example, although the invention has to be invented during the course of the, the uh, employment, case law shows that uh, um, as long as the employment relationship, employer and employee relationship, has not been terminated, this condition is met. So if there is such a, a takes a leave of absence for one year, he is still employed. As a matter of general patents law, he is still employed, and therefore the, the condition of uh, having invented his invention during the course of employment is met even when he is on a sabbatical. Okay? Um, and, and the bylaws of the university may, may uh, uh, remedy such difficulties, but this is a position under general law. Um, and this is, this is the case even if the invention was conceived during the employee's third time uh, at home. And, and I think that the position of the researchers in the university who are expected to invent is far worse than every other uh, employee in Israel. And, and, and because the, the uh, willingness of the court to, to, to rule that the invention belongs to the employer is stronger when you are hired to invent than when you're, when you're doing secretary work or something or uh, gardening work and not expected to uh, invent. Although, again, although the invention has to be invented as, as a result of the employment, case law shows that the causation can, which is necessary to uh, create the uh, ownership for the employer, may be very weak, very, very weak. Uh, so at the end, whether it's uh, as a result and during the course or um, well, it's, these are community requirements or territory requirements, it makes no different, difference. Uh, think for as long as you're employed, if there's a weak causation between your employment and the invention, the title will uh, be vested with the uh, employer. Um, judicial precedents on uh, monetary compensation to employee, the employees are very scarce. The rate of royalties, if it, if it were going to be based on the industry whose comparables would be low. In general, rate of royalties paid to researchers in the Israeli institutions is higher than in other places. Um, if you'd like to see the data, you can, you can have a look at the interesting uh, report and work by Schaeffer, Dr. Schaeffer, Dr. Frank, uh, by the, the Neyman Institute. Um, and the future of the, in the legislation, legislation arena is also not so bright. For example, in the pending bill that I've mentioned, uh, it, it was suggested to limit the remuneration of an employee in the university to three times the annual salary. No more millions of dollars. Three times the annual salary, and that's it. I know that it's going to be maybe changed in months or so. But even if it's annual, although it's, well, that's more, it's, uh, it's not the millions that we were talking about. <laughs> no, it, it has been changed. It? That's it. it has been changed. Thank you, Iran. We'll have uh, time at the end to. What happened to the microphone? Uh, I'd like now to ask uh, Zvika Archten uh, to speak up. Zvika. Uh, was the Vice President for Technology Transfer at the Weizmann Institute, and about four years ago, he was responsible on updating the bylaws of the Weizmann Institute regarding intellectual property rights, inventions, etc. So he knows all the details of what we are uh, talking about from the point of view of the most successful uh, Israeli Research Institute in terms of uh, success in, in technology transfer. So please. Am I being taped? Yes. You don't want to? <laughs> okay, so the talk will be less interesting. To the microphone, so you, you will be taped. What? Is it working? Yeah, it is. Okay, thank you for inviting me. Uh, Mark Twain once was uh, invited to give an address. And after agreeing, he was asked, uh, how much time do you need? And uh, he replied saying, well, if it is on uh, a subject I'm really an expert on, 10 minutes, 15 minutes suffice. If I so-so you know, about it, maybe 30, 40 minutes. If I hardly know it, I can talk about it indefinitely. So, 
10, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, Professor D David, uh, uh, David's uh, presentation was, uh, should universities seek to commercialize their faculties' research? I think the more correct, more accurate question should be, what is the best way, the best way that innovations conceived and developed at the university will find a way to the market for the benefit of the public? We are heavily supported by the public, either directly from the government or through research funds or benefactors, etc. And therefore, it's the duty of the management, and I understand that the, man, the higher management is not here anymore, uh, uh, to see to that, hmm? to see, I thought it would be less interesting, to see to, see to it that the fruits of the results here, of the, of the research here, I'm not talking about patents right now, the fruits of the results, if, possi if possibly uh, commercialized, should be done so. so the task of the management is to look around and examine on the, level, on the level of the university what is the best way to do that. Okay? And to contemplate various alternatives. And in order to find what the best way, when, when I am looking for, if I need the eye operation, then I go, I'm looking for the best surgeon. I'm not doing statistics of all the surgeons in the world. I'm doing the best, I'm, I'm looking for who the best is, what his methods are, and then I go. And the best uh, 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 university or institutions, not in Israel, in the world of doing that is the white man. Sorry to break. It is recorded. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and now let me tell you what, according to what criteria do I dare saying that this is the best institution. If you measure the impact on industry of innovations, directly or indirectly, through YEDA, YEDA is, is our remote, YEDA considered remote by I don't know how many, I don't know much time. Uh, 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 the Watson Institute is surely the best, at least per research uh, uh, effort, per capital. Products on the shelves that are sold based on Weizmann Institute's uh, uh, innovations, again, pale size of the university is, is maybe the highest in the world, okay? The ability to do all that with hardly affecting the academic life on campus, it's hard to measure it, but we succeed. The Weizmann Institute is open, even though, or, or not in spite, but but although we are the best in commercialization, it's open. To go to the Tel Aviv University, uh, to, if you go to Razi Institute at the gate, they will let you in. You only uh, should tell them where you want to go. And then you go there. There are no secrets. Everybody, everything is open, okay? All the, 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 the results are published. And all of it is on, on very basic level. Then, a measure which is uh, uh, easier to measure, but it is false on my list, is the revenues coming from royalties to the institute. Nominally, not per research budget, nominally, it is the largest in the world by many percents, many, many percents, Professor David, many percents. In all the graphs that you have shown, we, we, we surpassed nominally. If you now you, you, you measure it per a, a, a budget, it's far much more than that. And last, maybe not least, and I'm telling you that only because I was warned that I may be facing hostile audience, okay? Money is going to professors, to researchers, as a result of commercialization, the White Institute is probably the highest in the world. And we have several millionaires, and we are not envy of them, several, I will not that, that, that really, uh, uh, in the last few years, uh, took home millions of dollars, net maybe, as a result of the commercialization, without leaving their laboratory, without getting involved in, in negotiations with industry. All that was done by our tech transfer company. So, 
what I'm going to tell you is on what, how this came about, what is, in my opinion, the basis for this success. Okay. And, and uh, my credentials, uh, Hagit mentioned, I ran the, the, the show for several years. I was a instrumental, I hope, at least helped in the reform or update of the bylaws. I, when we prepared the, the, the amendment of the bylaws, we really made a very serious and, and, and uh, uh, effort to understand, to, to, although uh, already at that time we probably were the, the best in the world in, according to some criteria, still we learned all what was going on in the world. Well, we were open enough maybe to change the whole, uh, our, whole our attitude. And we concluded uh, that uh, what we have concluded, and I'll, I'll list the, the underlying uh, uh, principles. And, and then myself, I was a, a part of all on the steering committee of uh, the EU, uh, an EU European uh, uh, Union uh, mission to evaluate uh, what is the uh, best tech transfer from large public research institutions to industry. So I, I was involved also on that part of the of the scene, and at least uh, the EU uh, it was quite professional and not very similar to what Professor David uh, depicted about the EU uh, vision or whatever. Now, what are what are the underlying principles at the Weizmann Institute? First of all, the comparable advantage of a university professor is basic research, is not commercialization. That's what we know how to do, okay? Professors do not know or are not equipped, at least they, 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 at least they, they devote a couple of years to, to study that with the knowledge how to negotiate, how to, to do tech, to tech time, transfer, etc. That's principle number one. So we want to keep, to keep, and to keep the, the flavor of having basic research on campus uh, uh, it, by all means, we don't want, we don't let industry to interfere with what uh, we are doing. More or less, a principle of basic research is, it was mentioned here before, you give, you allot money to the researchers and you don't tell them what to do, whatsoever. And in parenthesis, I think we, all, all of the, whole, the whole community, the, 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 the university, the research university, should educate the public should educate the state controller about it. They don't understand it. In the very basis is that, they, that I, as a mathematician, get some, I'm a mathematician, like theoretical mathematics, I, I, I get the money, and nobody tells me what equation to examine or to try to solve. Okay? And this goes, this is valid also for industry. So at the right Institute, we do not allow industry to direct or to be involved in the research. And I, as a vice president, or at the same time was in charge, I was in charge of, of uh, Yeda, our remote, we turned, we declined offers of hundred thousands of dollars by uh, industries that would give it only under the conditions that they will have a saying in the lab. We said no, okay, as a principle. Now, when com commercializing, when licensing, we want money, everybody wants money, but this is not our prime goal. We are more interested in, in, the, in seeing at the end of the day the product on the shelf. This is our prime goal. And again, we, we have a clause in, in our, in our uh, standard uh, uh, contract with industries that unless they develop it to the point where they really are trying this to come up with a product, unless they do that, they the contract terminates. We never assign patents. We are the owners of patents. We never assign. And the reason is not to maximize the revenues. Not at all. The reason is that sometimes, or quite a lot, you get very, very offers from industry that want industries that want the patent, the dependent, in order to freeze it. And maybe the expected revenue that we may get may be higher than really developing the, the, the product. Still, we decline the offer. Because the mission of the of the institute or university is to at the end of the day to see the product on the shelf. Now, third or fourth uh, 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 parameter is that tech transfer is a profession. Professor David, I don't remember, he used 
maybe, I don't know if you use the, the maybe not the, the, the word virus, but you, you really uh, gave a depiction of, of them as, well, these guys were somehow invented and now we cannot, go, we cannot get rid of them, of the tech transfer uh, uh, offices, okay? I can very easily do that about economists, okay? very easily, okay? It's a profession, it's a very serious profession. It's not easy, it's a new profession, relative. it is a profession. Uh, it, you know, I, I know many scientists personally, I'm myself as a, a, a scientist, and sometimes it's hard for a scientist, like a scientist to, to perceive that there are some issues that he, that somebody else knows better about it than, than, than he himself, in a way, okay? It's not an easy task to, to, to have the tech transfer. In many respects, professional uh, 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 side, the, 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 professional of, the professional side of, of being able to to match the, 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 the invention, which in our part is on a very basic level to the need, to the product. It, it's not an easy task. Then to negotiate. It's not, I, I've seen too many uh, uh, examples of negotiations done by private professors or private people, for instance, that simply ignore the, the, the issue of in, indemnification. We, uh, she put in here. Okay. You know, that's not important. It will not happen uh, 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 to me, okay? Who will sue me? Well, once the money is come in, everybody will sue. Okay? And, and uh, so it is a profession, and it is a needed profession. And talking about suing, etc., also, one needs a very strong and stable institution to support the tech transfer. Let me give only three examples. There are many, many other examples. We, the White Sands had a dispute with a big company in Israel. And let me put it in a mild way. They had their own interpretation of how much royalties should be gained. Okay. It took several years. It took millions of dollars until it was resolved. I still have to see the private professor who can afford doing it. Right now, we are in a dispute, in the midst of a dispute with a company in the world that, no, they, it's not that, they, they, don't, not, they even do not, okay, let me do, not go into details, but the dispute on the level, uh, uh, sh, uh, is our professor entitled to, the, to, the, to, to be on the patent or not? We already spent a lot of money on that. I still, I see the professor who decides not to go along with Tel Aviv University or Ramot or, 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 and, 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 and sues that company for his own. I don't know if he'll, if he'll make it. The institute will get much more money, although this is not a prime role. The professor will get a lot of money, but we may lose it. The Hebrew University, and this is second hand, I was not uh, there. I don't know, I do not know that first hand, uh, sued. Uh, a big company, and the woman say on the basis that they, they abused the patent, and the woman was still lost. So when I mentioned that, that uh, uh, I, I, I had the, 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 the opportunity to mention it to one of, of the faculty members here who heard that I'm giving here a presentation and wanted to know what I'm going to talk about, and he is, uh, he was a little bit against uh, the reform, and, and he he said, okay, but, but uh, if, if, if the company abuses me, then, or my, my intellectual property rights, then I can, uh, I can find a lawyer or some company that will take the risk and sue the company uh, on behalf of, of, of myself. Well, first of all, I doubt it because I'm, and I don't see the lawyer that will take the risk without taking, in the case of success, more than 60% of the revenue to his company. Okay. So you need that. And moreover, uh, 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 our professors do all that, or, 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 or are represented in all that, without leaving their the laboratory. Okay, at the Water Institute, if a professor wants to be engaged directly with the industry, he or she is blessed to do that. Just leave the institute and do that. I mean, it's done. And we should not have any claim to any intellectual property rights if you do it outside the institute. But then you have to leave the laboratory, and they don't, because they know that they'll, have, they'll get much more money working with us. 
Okay, I'll, 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 I'm, okay, I was carried over. Let me just say the last, the, the, the last principle, and it is an essential, essential principle, and then all the other ramifications I'll, I'll skip. I'll, uh, is that uh, uh, we at the Weizmann Institute make it sure that the Institute has a tight control on its tech transfer operations, on Yeda, a tight control. The chairman of Yeda is a professor of the Weizmann Institute, and when there is a dispute, when there is a conflict of interest between commercialization and basic science, that person decides. He, his duty is to weigh the balance between the interest and decide, and he is instructed to decide basically in favor of the basic science. And based on these principles, I think we manage now to run a very successful tech transfer along with quite successful operation. Uh, I don't think that the Weizmann Institute uh, uh, scientists better than the Aviv scientists, but they don't think so, maybe, and, and, and I think that the, 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 the underlying, the reason, that the, the reason or the, 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 for, for this success of, of maintaining basic size and long, the long tech transfer is in, it is twofold. One, having the structure to do that. Two, having the right management to do that. Thank you. I have many more comments yeah. and replies, but... Uh, we, wa we want to leave time for uh, some discussion, but let's get to our uh, last panelist, uh, Professor uh, Yoel Mukir from uh, Northwestern University. Uh, Yoel will give us again the international, or maybe uh, the American and the historical perspective of our discussion. So uh, please, Yoel, but uh, use the microphone, please, so you can be recorded. Thank you, Fagit. Yeah, I'll try to be quick. I, I, my purpose actually here is just to, to, to make a few distinctions. I don't want to get to commit very strongly to one position uh, or another. Um, but uh, what I, I guess for me what is interesting is not what this does to the universities or what this does uh, to the people in the universities, but this is what, what matters to society at large. Okay? There are sort of three assumptions that we can all agree on and then and go from there. The first is that for in the last 150 years, at least in much of the Western world, um, economic growth and the continued growth of prosperity uh, have become increasingly to depend on the generation of new useful knowledge. Um, and the diffusion of that knowledge to those who can make best use of it, okay? So this is not a matter of just a small people. This is a matter of society at large. Secondly, I think we can all agree with the economist assumption that no matter how you turn it, people do respond to incentives, people do respond to opportunities, and that this is what will, to a large extent, drive them. And the third is that these incentives are shaped and formed by the institutions, that is, by the uh, formal and informal rules, legal and, 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 and conventions, that constrain behavior in every society, okay? So before I proceed, I want to make one more distinction, which is sort of my own distinction, or not really my own, but I borrowed it from the epistemologists, and it has to do with uh, what kind of knowledge uh, are we talking about? And I like the, the distinction between what I call propositional knowledge and prescriptive knowledge, which correspond to a large extent to our standard distinction between science and technology, but, but aren't quite the same. Uh, propositional knowledge is a description of natural phenomena and, and regularities um, that... Uh, that that's, that we generate, and this is very much like Paul's sort of fire, okay? This is knowledge that, that, that cannot be patented. It is not an asset in any shape or form, uh, uh, whereas prescriptive knowledge is knowledge that at least in principle can be patented because it takes the form not of a description of, it's not a knowledge of what, it's a knowledge of how. So it is in some sense a technique or a, a recipe um, how to make things, okay? What is interesting, and um, I'm not going to much, not going to talk about this here, is how these two knowledge relate to each other, it may well be that they're getting closer together today than they used to be in the past, but clearly what, what we should ask, the question we may want to ask is if, um, 
what kind of factors make uh, propositional knowledge grow? It is what, what kind of things stimulate what we used to call uh, uh, basic research? And the way I see it, and I'm interested in, in the different motives that people follow okay, and, that, and that drive them. And there are sort of four classes of motives that I see people responding to, although the weights of those three, of those four uh, motives differing uh, uh, a great deal from between individuals and even more so between societies. But let me summarize them. I would stay fall into four categories, greed, ambitions, curiosity, and, and, and uh, altruism, okay? So economic models largely give a very high weight to greed, okay? Uh, people respond to, uh, 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 they want to, uh, to make money, and nobody throws away money, and of course we don't throw away uh, income, and this is sort of economic science is based on that assumption. But at least in the historical record that I know, uh, for most people involved in the research, the great propositional research, greed is typically limited to the aspiration of the researcher for a relatively secure and adequate income uh, without necessarily making any kind of claim to the overall economic rents that this knowledge may have uh, that may may have uh, generated. Okay, the one somebody once said that the greatest economic rent of all is a quiet life, and a certain, after a certain threshold, this comfort is is attained by somebody who say gets uh, receives tenure in a basic basic university. For the vast bulk of scientists, let alone academics, that I know, this is by and large enough. If it no longer is, um, then perhaps the institutions of postmodern capitalism have increased the weight factor in, 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 in academic lives. And I think Paul is right to view that with some concern. But at least, as I see it, in, in most of history, ambition has outweighed grade. Now, ambition, I would define as something like peer recognition. Also, some researchers, of course, care not only about what their peers think about, they also care about general fame, they want a knighthood, they want to be media coverage, and so on. But it was put very well by Adam Smith uh, 250 years ago in his theory of moral sentiments, who claimed that all the, and I'm quoting here, all the toil and bustle of the world serve primarily to be becoming this object of attention and, and of approbation. When a man is successful, said Smith, his actions are the object of the public care. Scarce awards, scarce gesture can fall from him that is altogether neglected. Okay, but this sounds like some academics that I know. You know, people want to be taken seriously. They want to be respected by their peers. Uh, now, for them, winning a prestigious prize is a subject of great desire, even if the monetary significance of that prize is is, is very relatively small. Now, if there's a lot of money attached to that, like the Nobel Prize, you know, that's what we call in Hebrew, chupa, that's nice, that's a bonus, okay? But that is not, I think, um, uh, what the game is about. And the problem, of course, with this with these remuneration of, of, of kavod, of respect, is essentially that this is a positional rather than material in nature. It's to say it signals relative ranking, and okay, and the more you give of these prizes, you, dil you, you dilute their value. It sort of says you are the best in your field, well, only one person uh, can be the best. You cannot produce this endlessly, okay? Third, for many researchers, the work is attractive, not only because they get respect and because they get some kind of security, they like it. They do it for their own sake. They like the academic research, attracts the kind of people who, who are intellectually curious, who enjoy solving little puzzles. You know, senior full professors, and I see this every day, and so does everybody, so can get incredibly excited by saying, look, I solved this problem. It's a bit like doing the, the Sunday New York Times uh, 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 crossword. You know, it doesn't pay. There's no respect. You like it because it's a challenge. Okay, one of my colleagues once uh, uh, confided in me when, when we came to the office. He says, "Look, I can't believe that they pay me to do this. I should be paying them. I enjoy this so much." Finally, they're still in the world of research people. Um, who regard themselves as altruists, who want to do something for humanity as a whole. This would include not only somebody uh, like uh, Jonas Salk, who wanted to rid the world of polio, but many others, like, like say, Fritz Haber, who's going to make Germany in independent of the supply of nitrates, okay? You want to do something good for a group of people or for humanity as a whole. And so the question is, what kind of people are attracted to universities? Who does, who generates the kind of propositional research on which all of this prosperity uh, is, is, is based. And my view is that, by and large, this is people for whom the relative weight of greed is relatively low. Okay? These are people who are not in it for the money. 
I think there's early at a, at, 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 at a good scientist or a good economist's career, there's a sorting process goes on in which people bifurcate. Those who like money go one way, and those who want something else from life go to the universities, okay? And by and large, what I see happening around me now worries me because it seems to me that there is a small minority of members of the university community who sort of in midlife, after having already made the decision, sort of say, well, wait a minute, I actually like more money, money more than I thought I did, I became a professor, and so I'd like to make a few dollars on this, on, on this invention uh, that I have made. And, and I, I, I think this, this, this is maybe to a, a few people, I don't think it's we have reached um, uh, or what we call in the United States terms of the winner-take-all society and in that society the answer to the question if you're so smart how come you're not rich that answer is saying well I like what I'm doing that answer is no longer enough I, you know people are expected to like it's supposed to be uh, a millionaire okay relative society and these people are trying trying to round off their income there are people who do consulting but no. Medieval history and department that are being called to do um, uh, to do consulting. Now, I uh, the other thing that I think is going on, and that is this kind of thing that, that, that Paul's talking about. And this is sort of the last 25 years following the Bido law, in which universities have somehow decided that claiming property rights to the propositional knowledge that's being generated in their universities and the prescriptive knowledge based on it uh, may help them round off university budgets. I think Paul, I think this is an ignus fatuus. This will not happen. Universities have spent incredible amounts of money uh, on, on, on education, and they will not, I think, solve their fiscal problems. It may be 2%, it may be 5%. I don't know what it is in Weizmann. We asked Zwick, he wouldn't tell us, but, uh, maybe, uh, but it is not going to solve their fiscal problems. Uh, intuition, of course. Now, what? generated is by going to people who recognize that that they owe to the knowledge being generated by the universities and eventually end up uh, uh, donating it back this is this is this, this I think is one of the main sources of income of the United States we call it donations we call it al alumni support but that is what it's all about uh, the third reason I think is and here I'm very close to what Paul said. I think I think there is this is this is to some extent a bit of an, 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 an epidemic. I think it started in biotech generated research, a few related a few related industries, and I think it's particularly there difficult to distinguish between knowledge that is propositional, that is pure science, and knowledge that can be it can be applied. Let me give you one example, however, of how this can be stopped. Um, Harold Varmus, the previous director of the National Institute for Health, 
uh, had for a while lift restrictions um, on the NIH employed scientists to earn outside income. And so according to the Financial Times uh, a week ago or so, at least 530 of the few thousand uh, uh, scientists that were employed by the NIH received fees or own shares in biomed companies between 1999 and, and 2004. Now the new director uh, of the NIH, Elias Zarhouni, um, put an end to all that. And what he said was very interesting. He said, look, he says, my staff scientists, okay, make $130,000 a year, okay? They are well remunerated, okay? If you want more, make more, make more money than that, go work for industry, okay? You, okay? you cannot serve two masters at the same time, no matter how you look at it. Many, I think, feel the same, same should apply to NIH uh, um, uh, uh, funding as well. I want to make one more, one more point, and, 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 and then I'll quit. The university, as we know it today, um, has undergone a major transformation uh, over its, you know, many centuries of, 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 of life. The, the sort of research university, in which great teaching is supposed to combine with great, with, with great, uh, with great um, research, came out of the the. the um, the uh, fertile mind of Wilhelm von Humboldt, Paul called it Humboldt's dream. It remained a dream for much of the 19th century as well, in which universities very often uh, did not generate the interesting research and, 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 and countries found their way around it by founding research institutes where the research was being generated. Okay, so in, in, in France, they, uh, they found the Pasteur Institute, and in Germany, the, the uh, Kaiser Wilhelm, later the Max Planck Institute. These are ways of getting around universities because universities are conservative. They're not really generating research. The modern research university, as we know it today, is, is to a large extent an American idea, whether it came out of the, the, the Vannevar Bush memo of 19, famous 1945, or whether it was already early introduced by people, you know, say like, like Johns Hopkins and places like that. But this is not an institution that we can take for granted, okay? If we make it into a factory, it will become a factory. And what will happen to it, and, I can predict, and this seems to be a fairly reasonable prediction, is that we will, part of it, are like Machon Weizmann, okay, will, be, will eventually split off, become little enclaves of themselves, whereas the departments of sociology and English and philosophy, and places like that, which cannot participate in that, will become second and third class citizens with a different budget, you know, we're, we're being treated differently, and the community of the university, uh, knowledge, where uh, knowledge is generated in a, in a disinterested way, may well disappear. And so I, my view is, and this is, this is certainly uh, 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 very consistent with Paul's, I don't want the universities to be a, 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 a breeding place for would-be millionaires, because if you want to be a millionaire, you shouldn't go to the university. This should be large, publicly funded. Now, having said that, of course, if somebody in the university makes, you know, something professor is also a citizen and nobody you know and as, as an economist and all too well people don't throw away money okay but this should not be an objective if, it's, if you find a $50 bill on the street uh, 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 you pick it up but to start walking the streets back and forth all day long in the hope of finding you know a $50 or 50 shekel uh, bill on it strikes me as a bad way of running university thank you I really want to take uh, Zvika and Yoel and Iran, and I want to ask uh, Paul to come uh, here and uh, Ruti to replace me for an open debate for the very few of you who stayed here. One sure, please. One because, uh, please. My, my name was mentioned as one who does not want to, to, to reveal the, the, the percentage of uh, budget of what needs to be covered by the, by the, by the OIP revenues. The reason is that it doesn't matter. We do not do that to generate money. We do not do that for that. I, I am sure that the money that the water Institute management managed to get from donations, from benefactors, on the account of our success in marketing our products is much more than the revenues that uh, were flown from industry. This is not this is a byproduct. And the message that I was trying to convey is that you can be a professor doing basic research for the sake of basic research, more or less. We do not allow the professors to, to be involved in development, only the basic research. And yet, if you are smart, if you, and if you are in, a, in conjunction with a, 
is a, a, a system that will commercialize the patents based on your ideas, you may become a millionaire. Thank you for the last remark. Now we, uh, we are willing, of course, ready and able to open the, uh, for discussion for the, uh, our staff. But uh, of course, the, uh, our panel, uh, panelists can also, no, our panelists can also ask questions. But of course, the first, the uh, right, and no questions from the uh, audience? One, yes. That was a remark, but it can be uh, answered. Yes, please, Paul. Well, in one sense, I, it would be hard to argue that um, there are things are black and white and that there is no gray area. Uh, at the same time, uh, if, if we think about the institutions of society and we think about a pluralistic world, many different institutions which and define what membership in the club is like, then it doesn't follow that one should assert uh, that the right to belong to any club and to follow the rules and motives and ethos of some other club when you're in that club. Okay. So the, the question is, OK, uh, yes, uh, we'll just uh, pursue uh, greater income. Uh, the question is, should you therefore be able to act in pursuit of greater income in ways which uh, are detrimental to the purposes of the institution which you assimilate? So we would say no. We would say every institution can set its own rules. And what we're talking about in some sense is what is the space that the institution wants to say is uh, okay uh, to be in. And beyond that, what is the space that society should say the institution should set for itself? Because if we say, well, the institution can, can make of itself anything that it wants, okay, then by the same token, you say, well, does the institution have a right to redefine its purpose and go on claiming the resources which uh, it claimed when it was serving a different purpose? So this is, our, this is where the, uh, the problem is, because the, the university itself is a multivalent, multi-capability institution. And over the course of the last 50 years, universities have moved into many areas which they previously uh, did not pretend to have expertise in. They run television shows, they manage football teams in, uh, in, in the United States, the other kind of football, uh, basketball teams, uh, they, uh, they do lots of different things. Okay? So now many people say, well, they can do a lot of those other things because they're separated from the academic, uh, the, ac the core academic activities, and people talk about the core. Well, on the margin, of course, you start admitting taller students. Uh, who seem to be very good with basketball, uh, because you have, uh, uh, you have television rights to set. So, well, people are aware of this. And I think this is, the, this is one of the, the questions, is to how flexible 
How much of the gray area do you want to go to when you know that there will be pressures at the margin? If you are exploiting Professor X's, you, know, uh, you own the patent, you could license it. Uh, the professor comes and says, look, actually, we need a certain amount of development work. And my assistant professor in my department, he is the person who is going to do this. But it doesn't look like he's going to get tenured. And if he gets, doesn't get any, he'll go someplace else, and the work will be done there, and then you're going to lose that. So, at what point do people say, well, uh, you know, maybe we should give credit to the fact of, of being working on this very interesting applied work, and the tenure committee should be told to take that into effect. Well, it's that set of possibilities that keep conscientious administrators up at night thinking about how to protect that, uh, against that. Okay, and I think that's it. This is one other thing, not a different thing. We have a spirited argument that the question should be who benefits the public. I think that's a good way. As an economist to be the the commercial uh, for-profit development of new products. Skolnick uh, uh, at Utah, uh, whose company is Myriad, and I can I can say this because I, I sat on his uh, on his uh, doctoral defense. I was the outside chair of that. So I'll talk about him and. and One thing that Zwicka said, which I, I have always, this is a, lo a long debate I've had with, with many people, and he said, yeah, well, you, you know, we, we're not trying to maximize our income. We just want to manage this knowledge. And I think one of the things that I was thinking of when I was listening to Paul earlier now again is, is it's not totally clear that knowledge, uh, as it's being produced, should be managed at all. I think the uh, the key to su historical success in much of the of the Western world it has been that it has not been managed, or has been managed very little. The number of really major inventions that have been patented ever 
and made any money for him. But it is rather small, at least before 1914, that you can, you can count them on, on, and put them here on, on, on one slide. The vast bulk of, of very important inventions either were not patented at all, and the, and, the, and the inventor refused to take out the patent because he said, I am doing this for the benefit of humanity. Or else the patent was taken out, but it failed, or it was infringed upon a thousand times, and then eventually uh, 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 the, person, the person gave up. It, it's not so clear that it has to be managed. Once the knowledge is out there, okay, there will be, unless it, there will be economic forces, exactly what Paul was, was describing, it will be produced cheaply it will be put it will be placed on the shelf if it does and it will benefit society at large that's what we do okay trying to sort of stop this in the middle and and, and, and withhold the knowledge in one, either by by keeping it But Jaffe and Lerner, uh, what terrible mess the American uh, by now. Physical capital is managed the way the environment is managed precisely because of the kind of thing. It is non-rivalrous. One, it's out there. Okay, the cost of, for me, if, for me, of sharing it with you is I don't have any less when I give it to you. This is this is this is the crucial insight. It's why knowledge is not a commodity. Why it can't be priced properly. Okay, so, I, so I'm, I'm far from convinced that it should be managed, except for the one cases where the knowledge can be dangerous, okay? We're doing a very poor job, by the way, in managing it that way. I mean, you can see how, how the knowledge of, 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 of computer of computer program is continuously being abused by viruses, by, uh, by spam now, by Trojan horses and things like that. We're not very good at managing knowledge. That's why I'd like to see knowledge managed. I'm not talking sure that it should be managed financially, which is a thing that you have in mind. Speak, I guess you should respond to that. We not manage knowledge. Who manages knowledge? We manage intellectual property, property, not knowledge. Let's be uh, accurate. Okay. Now, one can bring, come up with examples for also for examples. But go to the basics of why the patent law is there altogether. This is a technical uh, issue. It's not an economic issue. Okay. No company, no individual will will will, will invest. I don't know, one hundred million, fifty thousand dollars, ten million dollars when there is a risk where uh, uh, at the end of the process when the, when the product is ready somebody else will come and, say, and, 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 and use the development and, and sell the same product uh, and, and, and all the investment uh, is gone. This is the basic, the patent law is there in order to make society benefit from ideas. This is the, the, the underlying philosophy of the patent law. It has been long ago, and I think, based on my knowledge, which is not a intellectual property, knowledge of what is going on, this is very clear as well. Let me also respond very uh, quickly. I am all against a university, I'm using your uh, words, uh, word in the call, that you, a university will start activities for profit development. I'm against it. Not development. The basic science should continue as is. And if there is an opportunity to use, not to make money, that money is the byproduct. I'm certain that I'm, I'm trying to convince you about it. If there is an opportunity that the fruits of the research will help society, will benefit society, there will be a product on the market, universities should not forfeit, should go after it. And let me use an analogy. What would you 
say about a university administration, they, they, not, they do not care about the dissemination of knowledge information created at the university. They, do, they wouldn't care if professors will publish or not publish their results. They would allow professors to uh, 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 mathematicians to work for 30 years and hide the results in the door. Okay? This will be a bad management. Now, not always you manage it by forcing the mathematician to publish the results. You cannot do that. So you create a moment of incentives. So I'm publishing the results, not to make money, but to be, to be invited, my results, to be invited to, I don't know, a conference in, in the Bahamas. Okay? Or, or elsewhere. Okay? I enjoy it. Okay, but these are, these are sets of incentives to, uh, uh, to, to disseminate the knowledge that I create. And the same is valid for intellectual property. The by the law. I don't know what the history is and what the purpose is. It's very important to incentivize the management of the university. You, you underestimate the role of the university in facilitating the research and the tech transfer. If the university will not be, will not have the, the right incentive to do that, it will not occur, and the, the, and the public will not be benefited. And the bylaw, uh, the by the by uh, act is very important. At the ADA, the Weizmann Institute, they accept the were several potential patents that were not patented, and the results were published without patenting because some government uh, agency or, or, or ministry did not want to write a letter, although they supported it, a letter saying that the, the White Institute is entitled to the to the intellectual property rights. So we have decided not to patent. It's not worth it. it has the, the public benefited from that? No. Sorry. Well, maybe we should give Iran, who hasn't responded yet. To the issue of uh, management of knowledge, whether knowledge should be managed or not. And then once more comment concerning small difference between general patents and medicine. In medicine, it's even more important where the patent and it gets many more. If I have a new drug in a package, open public domain, don't account on no no company in the world, neither use any company, not European, even even on the Chinese company that will spend a million of dollars to go for. After the proof of concept that I get them to go for safety and efficacy, what happens in this case? Very simple. You lost. You gave it to the public. You spend the public money. You gave it to public. It's possible. Because if then I face it in few cases, there is no strong paper. Heard about it. Same goes for chemistry, physics, yeah. mathematics. Pull you away, yeah. Okay. I, I, mean, I, I think, again, just in the same way that we want to recognize there are many different uh, 
of kinds of university researchers and many motives, in many different kinds of universities, but there are also many different kinds of adventures in different areas. It's true that in uh, pharmaceuticals, in biochemicals, uh, in some branches of industrial chemistry, Also, the development, testing, uh, and distribution costs in, in all of those areas. The pharmaceutical companies spend on detail man and marketing enormous amounts, which they have to recover through large partners. Now, the first thing. if they didn't have that. Which are done by uh, both examining other industries. Uh, take the semiconductor industry is a very good example. That was an industry which has a very short product cycle, which nobody uh, protected uh, their stuff on patents. That lead time, uh, that whole series of other devices being first down the learning curve, industry, getting down the yield curve is very important. Uh, virtually uh, only uh, four or five industries out of 26, uh, which I studied, uh, wind up saying that the, the, the most important way in which they appropriate the private benefits is through intellectual property. Others say, no, well, we use trade secrecy in some cases, we use uh, the first of, of the market, uh, we create specialized high services, marketing, a whole variety of, devi of devices. A very small number of industries have been very successful in driving the legislation of the intellectual property system within, uh, within recent times, and this is quite well documented. So the notion that, uh, that there would never be a university uh, invention uh, that could ever move into onto the shelves uh, if there was uh, if there were no patents. It's, it's just not true. So um, so one must oversee the case that there are areas in which to set from doing basic fundamental research of the kind that I can do does to go into a commercial product is not the big step and therefore it's quite quite possible that without De deflecting the development, the research habits of the university. I'm agreeing with you. It's possible to actually score some big hits. But that's not the only way in which universities can actually get funded. Joel referred, and I think it's useful, uh, to say, well, the university uh, also can get a lot of money from support from private resources by actually giving away its knowledge. Uh, just take the case of uh, e-learning, online learning. There was a scramble for universities to claim intellectual property, own the professor's notes, uh, own all of the notes supporting any tapes that they made, any programs that they wrote. And there's a lot of there's a lot of regulation in Britain on this and in American universities. Consortia were formed. Most of them are, are now more or less dissolved. Who's made the most money? out of this? MIT. President Vest said, we are just going to put everything online. Uh, there was a great uh, sort of uh, tremor went through this thing. They raised more money from private foundations, from the Pew Foundation. Now they, they got hundreds of millions of dollars were given to them for for having created and what they have created in the D space. Now, had to become a model which many other universities follow. Meanwhile, British universities are suing each other uh, over the fact that one university professor took a database that they put up and moved to another university. So University A is suing University B and saying, no, in, you know, under the database right, okay, they have set up insane system in which they're trying to extract money from e-learning courses in each university. And who are they selling the courses to? To other universities. So this is the paper transaction, which is just uh, taking in each other's you know, wash, uh, and it all washes out, except 
an enormous amount of administrative time and creative, they're hiring people to, to, to manage this. This is just an unnecessary thing. There are other routes. Stanford has made, well, will eventually make a lot of money from the 600,000 shares of Google, which it has, and the 600,000 shares of Yahoo, which it has. How did they get those? Well, give it to the yeah. graduate students. Uh, who, in each case, went to the university and said, we have an idea. Will you put money, will you back this? Will you help, will you pack this? And the university said, no. You, you have a business idea? No. Go. We'll give you the name of uh, a couple of good advisors, some venture capitalists. Go and start your business. Do that. And that's what they did. And, and so there, there is a way that things come back to the university. So what I want to suggest is this is not the only route. Uh, for universities to follow. And, it, and if you just make that the route, then you do redirect the efforts of the faculty. Because while it may be true that there's a small step in many cases from a discovery to a product, in many cases, the step is a little bit bigger. And if you encourage people to go for the patents, then they spend time working in that direction. And I think there's a good bit of evidence that there is a redirection going on in American universities in terms of the time that people are spending. And worse, we now have something beyond Joel's uh, sort of a mixture of greed and ambition, which is the ultimate confusion, which I had two venture capitalists complaining to me that they were just giving up doing <coughs> startups with university professors. They say, it's now the case that in order to fulfill the ambition to be a university administrator, by being a dean of the School of Engineering first, and then maybe a president, the president of our university, who was a dean of engineering. What people feel they need is a $10 million startup on their CV. <laughs> now, okay, in order to have that, that means it must be their invention and their invention alone. So even if they have a good invention, they won't let us buy another patent and make the company with a set of patents. It has to be their one patent. They, they don't want the business. It could be a $100 million business. They want a $10 million startup which could be sold so that they can be done for the research. So this is the, the post-modern post uh, age in which, in which the success in the market is the emblem which allows you to do something else that you'd rather do, which is not run a business, but to, to be a university administrator. Well, this, can, this is the end state where you get thoroughly mixed up. Uh, and uh, they say it's very difficult to actually transcend. A survey, which I could have given you, uh, of 16 leading companies, in which they discuss offices and technology license, fully document what we've been told. It is a profession. It can be done very well. It should be done very well. I applaud everything you said. But on average, it's not done well. And if you think you have problems paying for university researchers, wait till you have to bid in the market for really good people who know how to manage portfolios. Because the sums that they can command in the industry are many multiples of what the typical Office of Technology Licensing Office uh, will pay uh, for research. And as a result, the firms who comment on this, vice presidents and technology managers from the firm, say, first of all, we don't know actually, most of them. The Weizmann Institute is an exception. There are four or five other universities which have a very good reputation on this. Usually, they, they, they've been very successful. They plowed their money back into really supporting a tech office. So you've got a circle there. But the other people don't have the money, can't afford it. They, you know, the firms say they patent badly. The firms who try to license them, the, the patents are not well drawn. They're over, they, they think that they're the, the next best thing to slice bread. They want incredibly high royalties from it. Uh, they don't know actually how to run this business. And then they're incredibly greedy. Uh, and so the words that they use actually uh, in a published article that's coming out, they had to modify that because the expletives that describe the university was so, was so hard that they tried to find a lot of ways to sort of uh, take the edge off it. But in general, you know, they say, you know, this is a step back. We don't want this. We want the big firms saying we want them out of this area. Okay? We, we don't want, it's not that we don't only, we 
run like the companies. It says that they're bad competitors, you can't do business with them, and they mess up the field. Now, this is not the widespread institute, and it's not Stanford, and it's not Columbia, and it's not Berkeley. But, okay, so how many really uh, professional uh, operations can you have? I would suggest that you pool all of them and have this run in the best way and separate it from the university and have, and there's a part of, there are several good models where the universities get a flow back proportional to what they put in uh, to the pack of the pool. Uh, yeah. So I agree. Managing is important. Good managing and professional managing is very important. But it's not clear that the universities are set up to do this, you know? As they say with universities, it's the opposite with armies. Armies are created, organized by geniuses to be run by idiots. With universities, it's the other way. <laughs> I, agree. I agree with this time with a lot of what you were saying. Okay, let me show you. Okay. The, don't know. We let, there are other ways to generate uh, money for universities. And I can reveal that the donors' relations to the vice minister is much uh, section is much larger than here. Okay. Yeah, there is uh, maybe 13 people from the manage, from the CEO to the lady that cleans the, the, the floor, and the donors' relations uh, uh, section is larger. So there are other ways. At the MIT, when they decided to uh, put uh, uh, e-learning on the on the web, somebody was sitting down and thinking, should we patent it or not? And that person uh, uh, arrived at a, at, a, at a very clever uh, uh, decision. And this is the the the, the, the being uh, getting clever decisions. This is the task of the uh, Okay, but at least. That person had the opportunity to patent or not the patent. The message that we heard here is that abolish all the patents or all the uh, all the the, the intellectual property. Uh, no, the message, the message is, is is do it, but but outside the university. Not the university. That's, 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 that's a different issue to do it outside or inside. And, 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 and to do it outside or inside, there is a, the British model, there are several companies uh, in Britain, and in, uh, to, to my understanding, the, uh, it, it, it is inferior to doing outside because the, the same reason that I mentioned before, uh, uh, specialized, uh, no, sorry, incentives, okay? You, you don't, you need something from the inside, somebody that is really inside the university, inside the institute, really to be able to match the, what's going on in the laboratory with the needs of the industry. Really to match, really to be there, to be there. Now, what? an outside company will not be able to do it. By the way, companies are, companies are invited to the White Institute. They come to seminars, they come to the laboratories. It's, everything is free there. You don't need another company to, to do that, to, to facilitate it. You need somebody that knows both ways, how the institute operates and what are the needs in order to uh, uh, Okay, I would like to take the advantage of the chairperson. And the, uh, first of all, I think now you understand why I thanked previously all our guests, because I think it was a, a very exciting a, a presentation, discussion, and the issues that has been raised. I believe that now you fully agree with me that the... Uh, a, the idea of this workshop was, as I wrote it here, uh, to try and give the audience the ability to examine commercialization more broadly and from several angles. Uh, I think this was our aim, and I feel at least that it was fully achieved, and I thank again for uh, choosing uh, those excellent uh, speakers. And I thank you all, and I'm very glad that we had the chance to video it for all those who missed it and give them a second chance to watch this interesting conversation. See why they come here, to hear the Dominican speak. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs> By the way, probably in the Senate, you'll have a second chance to re-chew the, uh, the ideas. Now you'll have a better background. <laughs> because, because I think I have a right to see to uh, I Yeah.
Thank you very much. That was, that was fun. Yeah, I